in your hands, to dig in the Bible, to study the Bible. It's how you're going to get to know God's will for your life. Amen, church? All right. Matthew 28, verses 16 through 20. It says, Then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is the word of God. Let us pray. Lord, we do give you thanks and praise for your holy word this morning. Father, we ask that you add a blessing to the reading of it. And now, Father, as we come before it, I ask that you would cleanse me of sin, empty me of self, and fill me afresh with your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you would come forward as the true preacher this morning and that I would fade to the back and that we'd hear from you and you alone. For, Lord, if we don't hear from you and what you have for us, we have gathered here together in vain. Father, I pray that your mercy would be abundant and that you would bring a fresh reminder of what we as a church are called to do. Father, and that we, we would be, as Christians, about our Father's business at all times. Lord, if there be one here today that doesn't know you as Lord and Savior, we pray that today would be the day of salvation. Today, their spiritual eyes would be open. Today, they would see themselves in their sin and their need for the cleansing blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And that today, they would cry out to you for salvation. And for those who are your children that are here today, continue to make us and to mold us into what you would have for us in this body for your glory. We pray this all in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior, and all of God's people said, amen. amen. Go ahead and have a seat this morning. Fourteen and a half years ago. At that time, I was appointed to be the pastor at Grace Church. It's weird to think of now that it's been 14 and a half years that I was put here as a young 26-year-old, which when I think about it now is just ridiculous. <laughs> Amen. Amen. It had to have been the Lord. <laughs> but I was put here to lead, guide, and direct you as a church, as a local church, to fulfill the mission that God had given you. And while over those 14 and a half years, the people have changed, I don't know if there's more than 50 people that have been here since the beginning anymore. Take that as a plus or a minus, I don't know. The ministries may have changed. The methods may have changed. But praise God, the mission, regardless, remains the same. The mission remains the same. And our mission, Kathy, I, I, yeah, there you go, awesome. Our tech people are great. Our mission since December of 2009, has been as following. To glorify God by making, maturing, and mobilizing disciples of Jesus Christ. Say that with me, church. To glorify God by making, maturing, and mobilizing disciples of Jesus Christ. If you're a part of this local congregation, I would hope that at some point, you can go back to the other one, you memorize those. And if anything else, you would just memorize those three M's, making, maturing, and mobilizing disciples of Jesus Christ. Every so often, it's good to revisit our mission. 
I believe the last time I revisited this was about six years ago. And as we begin our new entity, we've been in it now in our seventh month, no longer as a United Methodist Church, but now as an independent church. You have been faithful, you have been generous, you have been led by the Holy Spirit to get us where we are today. We have seen new families come in to be a part of what we're doing. We have seen people rejoin us. We have seen people celebrate with us. We've seen faithfulness of people stepping up within our congregation. But sometimes it is necessary, especially as we begin a new endeavor, as a new entity, as Grace Church Shrewsbury, to revisit and remind and remember what our mission is. Who we are in Christ what he has called us to, and where we are going. And ladies and gentlemen, our mission, just as any church that exists within the world, should be rooted in Scripture, and it has been given to us by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It is Matthew 28, it is verses 18 through 20, and it's good to remember, it's good to memorize, because if we know what we're supposed to do, we can remain focused in doing what God has called us to do. We have the background we have here in the text a very familiar passage that Jesus gathers his disciples after his resurrection. After he has gone back and forth on the earth for 40 days and he has shown himself to be resurrected. It is undeniable that he has beaten death and hell. He has been preaching the gospel of the kingdom. He has readied the disciples to take charge. And now he gathers them on this mountain and he gives them the commission before he ascends back into heaven. He tells them what they are to be doing until he returns to gather his church. And folks, that commission may be some 2,000 years old, but it's still relevant today. It's still necessary today. It's still impactful for today. It still needs to be accomplished because until the trump sounds and the clouds part, we should be about our Father's business for the sake that one more person, one more soul would come to faith in Jesus Christ. He gives them the mission of the church. And folks, there should be certain passages that should be preached often. There should be certain passages that we're reminded of. Because let me tell you, especially when it comes to the mission of the church, the church is often quick to forget. We wrap ourselves up in so many other things that honestly, from a heavenly perspective and an eternal perspective, just don't matter. And we do more damage than anything for the kingdom of God when we get wrapped up in those secondary things because it's the secondary things, you know what happens? We bicker, we fight, we divide, and we do more to hurt the kingdom of God than build the kingdom of God. But if the church can keep its eyes focused on Christ and its mind focused on the mission that God has given us, we will bring glory and honor as we proclaim the kingdom of God. We need to remember, and just as we're coming off of Advent, where we have seen that the second coming is nigh, that soon the Lord will return, and that time is running short for those to get saved, what better time now after we remember of that grave reminder to be reminded of what our mission is and what we need to be about, because there's some urgency when it comes to the mission of the church. Over these next three weeks, we are going to be firmly planted in Matthew 28. We're going to look at some surrounding passages. We're going to look at the sister passages of the Great Commission in Luke and in Mark. But we're going to talk about the commission that Christ has given us. Remembering and rediscovering our commission as a church to make, mature, and mobilize disciples of Jesus Christ. And today we're going to begin 
with making disciples. Making disciples. What does it mean? And are we, as a church, doing it correctly? Are we, as a church, making disciples? Am I personally, and you personally, making disciples of Jesus Christ? Do we, what do we have to do in order to accomplish this? Are we glorifying God in doing so? That's a huge one, right? Isn't that at the very beginning of our mission statement, to glorify God by? Are we glorifying God in making disciples of Jesus Christ? And do we truly understand what we have been called to do? Because like I said before, too often we get distracted. So let's take this passage and let's chew on it a bit. Let's chew on it. Let's savor it. Let's get every ounce of flavor there is. How many guys like beef jerky? Come on. Put that beef jerky in and it's a little tough and you just chew and chew and chew and chew. And at some point you get to the, after you get all the flavor and all the savor, you're able to swallow it and ingest it and put it into your body. That's what we're going to do with this passage over the next three weeks. Making, maturing and mobilizing disciples of Jesus Christ. So let's start first with what is a disciple? Obviously, that's something that's very important. we got to understand what a disciple is if we're going to make them. So you always got to go to the trustworthydictionary.com. And this is where I absolutely love the dictionary because the word disciple, Christianity, has the corner on the word disciple. First definition in the list, what is a disciple? It's defined as any follower of Jesus Christ. Any follower of Jesus Christ. Let me give you the biblical definition of a disciple. If it's any follower of Jesus Christ, Jesus says this in John 12, 26, If any man serve me, let him follow me, and where I am, there shall my servants be. You know what that means, ladies and gentlemen? It means that if you are going to be a follower of Jesus Christ, it means you go where he goes. You go where he goes. And last I checked, Scripture tells us that he is the light and he went into the darkness. He goes to the broken. He goes to the hurting. He goes to the sick. Last I checked, he went into dangerous places that needed to hear the gospel and proclaims it. Be careful, because a lot of people want to follow Jesus, but they don't want to go where Jesus has gone. It's uncomfortable. It's not nice. (laughs) It doesn't make us always feel good. You know where else Jesus went? He went to a cross. His truth that he proclaimed from his father about why he is here and what he is doing upset so many religious people that they put him on a cross. Ladies and gentlemen, you know what scripture tells you? That if you are going to be his disciple, you must take up your cross and follow him. You're called to go where Jesus goes if you're going to be his disciple. Wherever Jesus does his business, you're supposed to be there in the midst And while it may not all be bad or uncomfortable, you know what it also tells it? Where's Jesus right now? He's at the the side of God the Father. He's, He's in eternity. He's in heaven. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a disciple of Jesus Christ, one day, praise the Lord, you're going to follow him into glory and the suffering and the pain and the heartache and the and the toil and and the trials that you've been through for the gospel as his follower, where he leads you went, it's going to be all worth it because you're going to be with him in glory. (laughs) That's what a that's what a disciple does. A disciple follows Jesus. In fact, that's what we see in the Gospels, right? Every single time Jesus called someone to be with him, he called them and it says, and they followed him. He said, come and follow me to each and every one of his disciples. And some of the disciples brought people along with them. Aren't you glad this morning if you're saved (laughs) that even though you didn't know any better, 
as to who Jesus was and what he wanted you to do, at some point Jesus came alongside you and he said, hey, you, follow me. Follow me. Aren't aren't you glad that in his grace he called you unto him? (laughs) Aren't you happy, amen, that you responded? I hope you're happy that you responded. (laughs) I hope you got some joy this morning that you responded to his calling Because sometimes when he says, follow me, it's not necessarily the most ideal place that he wants to take you. It's not the most glamorous place he wants to take you. But praise God, at the end of the day, you're better off and blessed for it. Praise God. Any follower of Jesus Christ. But you know what the second definition is in that list? What is a disciple? Not just any follower of Jesus Christ, but it says a follower of the doctrines of a teacher or a school of thought. A follower of the doctrines of a teacher or a school of thought. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're his disciple, that second definition applies to you in the fact that of where we get our doctrines where we get our teaching. It comes from Jesus Christ himself. It comes from the eternal word of God. It comes from the word that you have, hopefully, in your lap or on your app this morning. It comes from the Bible. It comes from the mighty word of God, and it says that you follow the doctrines of the teacher, that you follow the school of thought as a teacher. Maybe that's why the psalmist declared in Psalm 119, 105, and 106, he says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. If I'm a disciple of Jesus, I'm following. He shows me where I'm at right now so I don't trip and fall. And his word gives me vision for the future as to where I'm going. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Amen. But I love what the psalmist continues to say. He says, I have sworn and I will perform it, that I will keep thy righteous judgments. Right there is a disciple. Someone who swears by that word, someone who stands on that word, someone who says they will perform all things in that word and they will keep thy righteous judgments, they will keep the decrees of Christ. So what is a follower? Let's just put it out there right now. What is a disciple of Jesus Christ? Someone who follows Jesus wherever he goes and someone who lives accordingly as to what the Lord has declared by the word of God. Boy, I don't know about you, but it gives you a little bit of a gut check this morning, doesn't it? I mean, it's pretty cut and it's pretty clear what a disciple is. Where do you stand on being a disciple of Jesus Christ? It's real quiet in here. Trying to make eye contact. and <laughs> Right? Allows you to do a lot of evaluation, doesn't it? Folks, it's pretty clear what a disciple is. This is the finished product, just so you know. This is what your goal is to get to. But you should be striving towards it. You should be willing to go where Jesus went, and you should be living according to his word. Not according to the world, not according to your own understanding, not according to your wants and your desires or your preferences, but according to his word. What is a disciple? Any follower of Jesus Christ and a follower of the doctrines of a teacher or a school of thought. So now that we've established what is a disciple, the next question is, if we're going to make disciples, how do we make one? (laughs) How do we make one, church? Well, look with me at the passage, Matthew 28, the end part, or no, the beginning part of verse 19. It says, go ye therefore and teach all nations. Now some of y'all Outside of the King James, it'll say, go and make disciples. It's substituting there. Make disciples, right? How many of you guys in your Bible, it says make disciples, right? Yep. King James gives a more defining quality here as to what it means to make disciples. It says to 
teach all nations. Okay, well, if I'm going to make a disciple by teaching, the next question is, what am I teaching, right? And this is where it's wonderful that the word answers the word, right? The word backs up the word, right? So when you go over to Mark 16, you don't have to turn there. Just mark it down, and you can go there later. You go over to Mark chapter 16, where you find Mark's version of the Great Commission. You hear him record this. Jesus says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. So what am I teaching? I'm preaching the gospel. That's what I'm supposed to take if I'm going to make a disciple. That's what I'm supposed to do if I'm to make a disciple. Now, I love, and this is where my weird mind goes, that Mark says, and preach the gospel to every creature. Does that mean I need to tell my dog that Jesus came and died for him? I I don't know. Maybe. Does Frankie need to know that he's a sinner? And that he needs to be saved? I, I mean, it says every creature. It doesn't say human being. It doesn't say person. But we need to proclaim to all of creation. You know what? The rest of creation already knows about the Lord. Did you know that? Scripture says that all of creation, which is where creature comes from, creation sings and gives glory to God. You think you wake up in the morning and you hear birds singing that they're just doing it to be nice and that's what God cleared them to do. In their chirp, chirp, chirping, you know what they're saying? Praise be to God that he has made me this way and praise be to God for the glory of his creation. When a dog barks, what is he saying? Roof, roof, thank the Lord that I'm alive. When a cat meows or a, or a cow moos, he's saying glory be. Y'all think I'm crazy. (laughs) Let everything that has breath. That's why I don't get upset if you've got a crying baby in this sanctuary. If you get annoyed by hearing a baby cry, what I hear in a sanctuary is, thank you, Lord, that my parents brought me to church and I'm crying out to him in my own way. He put breath in my lungs and I'm here today. Why? Because Scripture says that the kingdom of heaven is of the children. I know I'm yelling a lot today and <laughs> got to remember there's an open flame on this stage. I don't know if that's necessarily what John Wesley meant when he said, set yourself on fire for the Lord and people will come for miles to watch you burn. But you're to preach the gospel. All of creation is preaching the gospel. All of creation is bringing the gospel. And if you are the pinnacle of his creation, you are to be preaching the gospel. That's how you make a disciple. Well, what's the gospel? That's the next question, right? What's the gospel? What am I supposed to be declaring? Well, again, this is where the wonders of the word is. Luke 24. Here you have Luke's account of the Great Commission. It gives you more detail. In Luke 24, verses 46 and 47, listen to what Luke recorded. It says, And say unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it is behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. There's your gospel. That's the gospel you're supposed to be proclaiming, that Jesus Christ came He suffered on the cross. He died for your sins. His blood was shed. He rose from the dead on the third day. Why? So that there could be repentance and remission of sins. That's the good news, amen? That's the good news that if you accept and you believe, you're saved. Because there's only one person that was ever good enough to die and shed his blood, to cover your sins, to remit your sins. And that is Jesus Christ himself. And his blood atonement 
was seen by God and recognized by God as that is what was needed because that's why the grave could not hold him and death could not keep him and why he could overcome. And if he can overcome, you put your faith and trust in him for his work on the cross for your remission of sins. It says that you too will overcome in Christ Jesus. That's the good news. That's what you're supposed to be preaching. Notice it says, should be preached. In whose name? In his name. Why? Because there is no salvation found outside of Jesus Christ. He's the only one. He's the only one. That's good news. Folks, don't fall for the good news that some people like to propagate today by the simple fact that people say God loves you. There's a lot of a lot of people that will go around and say, well, the good news is very simple. It's, it's God loves you. In fact, you may have even seen some people going around and it's called the God loves you tour. Folks, the gospel is not just God loves you. In fact, it's very incomplete in saying God loves you. Listen to me. If the gospel is just God loves you, period, end of story, stop, then there's no reason for Jesus Christ to come. If it's God loves you, period, end of story, stop, there's no reason for you to change. He just, he loves you. He loves you right where you're at. He loves you just the way you are. Gosh, I hate those sayings. Incomplete. Not true. Ladies and gentlemen, Scripture says that God commended his love towards us through his son, Jesus Christ. God showed us his love by sending his son, Jesus Christ. Listen to me. You cannot know the love of God apart from Jesus Christ. And it is only through Jesus Christ can you experience the love of God. Outside of that, you cannot know it. Now, why is that important? Because you are are a sinner. You were born into sin. You were going on a highway to hell from day one. Scripture says there is no one righteous, not one, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is a gap and a chasm that separates you from God, and it is sin. And because of that sin, you are a child of the devil, and you are destined for hell. But praise the Lord, God sent his son. Amen. And he walked on this earth. He suffered and died on a cross to pay for your sins. His blood was shed to atone for your sins. He raised from the grave and there is remission of sin that can be found in him and him alone. Why? Because Jesus Christ does not want you to go to hell. He wants to save you out of your sin. He wants to save you out of hell that you can be reconciled unto God. That you're no longer a child of the enemy but rather you are engrafted into the tree of life. You're engrafted into the true vine and you become a child of the king and have the blessings and inheritance of a child of God. And listen to me. Your good works have nothing to do with it. Your good works have absolutely nothing to do with it. If you could save yourself, Jesus didn't have to come. But you couldn't. There was absolutely no hope. So why do I tell you all this? Because ladies and gentlemen, that's the gospel we're supposed to preach. We need to stop going into this world and just saying God loves you. Yes, God does love you, but why? God showed his love towards you through his son, Jesus Christ. Because if he didn't, you had no hope and you were going to hell because you're a sinner. Oh, I know in this day and age, it's not very popular to say. It sounds harsh. It's not very PC. I don't care. It's biblical. It's straight doctrine. And that's something you and I have to wrap our heads around. That if we have loved ones who do not put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ, who do not realize the depth of their sin and why Jesus came, when they take their last breath, they are going to an eternity in hell. It's a reality. 
but we've got the good news. We've got the gospel. We've got the answer to sin. We've got the answer to get out of hell. We've got the answer to salvation, and it's Jesus Christ. We're to go and preach it. The remission of sin. He came to save you from hell. Who do we bring it to? It makes it very clear. We bring it to all nations. We bring it to all nations. What's he talking about? Everyone who's not a disciple. This thing does not want to stay on my ear. Listen to me. You can't be a disciple, <laughs> right, if, 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 if you don't have Jesus Christ. So who needs to hear the gospel? Who are we supposed to? We're supposed to take it to those who don't know the Lord. Well, Pastor Jeff, that, that kind of goes without saying. Yeah, but this is where the church gets screwed up sometimes. Listen to me. The goal of Grace Church is to go forth and preach the good news to those who are lost, who are broken, who are dying without Jesus Christ, and to proclaim the kingdom and the gospel that they may be saved. Listen to me. Our number one priority and our main audience are those who don't know Jesus. those who don't know Jesus. That's our mission field. Because listen to me, the goal of the church is to reach the least and the lost. Jesus said in Luke chapter 5 verses 31 and 32, it says, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why did Jesus make the religious people so mad when he came? Yes, he spoke against their hearts. He spoke against their intentions, but they were also upset that if, that if he was who he said he was, if he was the Son of God, that he didn't go to them and pat them on the back and tell them how wonderful they were. But yet he sought out sinners. And this is what I'm saying where we get mixed up as a church. We spend too much time huddling amongst ourselves, patting ourselves on the back, fellowshipping with ourselves. Look, those things aren't bad in and of themselves, but when it means that we never go out into a world that doesn't know Jesus, when we never proclaim the gospel to people who don't know the Lord, when we never take time and do the most loving thing and tell someone about Jesus Christ and that he came and died for their sins that they may be saved, we're not doing what we're called to do. And listen to me, church. Listen to me. We sometimes have become way too inward focused. Hey, look, numbers are wonderful. Big numbers are wonderful. But that's not the goal. Listen to me. We've had a lot of people in the last seven months that have come and been a part of our church. We've had a lot of people in the last year that have come and been a part of our church. And they come in and they can say, I'm, I'm a Christian. I've put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm, I'm, I'm saved, Pastor. That is absolutely wonderful. We're glad that you are here. But listen to me. Now you can join us in the mission. Because far too often churches have been content with swapping fishes to build numbers and not going out and catching fish. Amen, Pastor Jeff. Amen, Pastor Jeff. We're not here to just swap people among churches. We're here to go out and be fishers of men and bring in new ones. I feel like I might be stepping on some toes this morning. You guys aren't a, see, look, baby saying thank you, Lord. At least, hey, look, listen to me. Out of the mouths of babes, you guys may have your toes being stepped on and not amening, but a child recognizes the truth when it comes. Amen, Pastor Jeff. Thanks for backing me up, baby. I appreciate it. <laughs> now, here's the best part. We're supposed to take this gospel message out to those who don't know? Whose job is it? Whose job is it? 
Is it the pastors? Did you see any pastors on that hillside in the text today? Just disciples. Ladies and gentlemen, the gospel message only gets out to make disciples when you, 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 you ready? Y'all. are a part of the process. How do I know this? Luke chapter 24, Luke's version of the Great Commission, the last verse that he writes after saying that Jesus told them to go out and preach in his name amongst all nations, beginning in Jerusalem, he then says, and ye are witnesses of these things. You You're supposed to go out and talk about how Christ came and died on a cross for our sins. You are supposed to go out and say how Christ has risen from the grave and is with the Father and he's coming back again. You are supposed to go out and talk about a gospel of repentance and remission of sin that we need to turn away from this world and follow Jesus and that he is the only one that can cleanse us from our sin, past, present, and future. It's not our good works, but it's the precious blood of Jesus Christ that saves. It's your job to tell people. It's not the church collectively. It's you. It's not your pastor. It's not your associate pastor. It's not your leaders. It's you. Why? Because if you're saved, you have a testimony of those things. You say, well, Pastor Jeff, ha, ha, you know, I'm not, I'm not very good at, I, I don't necessarily know how to unpack the gospel or, the, or, or give the gospel message to someone. Then just tell them your testimony. That's the greatest evangelism tool that you have, your testimony. I once was blind, but now I see. Amen. How many of y'all can raise your hands and remember, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Come on, church. If you're saved this morning, you've got a testimony to share that one day you met Jesus and you realized your sinfulness and you realized his holiness and what he did for you and you took him on, that he washed you in the blood just as you were and now you're saved. You love to proclaim it. Saved by the blood of the lamb. Saved by his infinite mercy. His child and forever I am. Come on now. It's your job. Don't let pastor ruin his voice doing it for you. Don't let pastor get burned out doing it for you. You know one of the greatest things, and I heard it in the interview that Jonathan had. I hope I'm not sharing too much. We're looking for a pastor that will grow our church. It ain't the pastor that grows the church. It's the people. It's the people when they take seriously the mission that God has given them to proclaim the gospel. Well, pastor, I share the gospel with people in my actions. Look, that is 100% yes, you need to do it, right? You need to, right, what's it say? Sometimes everybody needs to be sharing the gospel and when necessary, use words. It's a wonderful saying. But folks, actions only take you so far. At some point, you need to speak. At some point, you need to share the truth. How do I know that? Because the word of God itself says in Romans 10, 17, so then faith come by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You got to say it at some point. You got to at some point be willing to open your mouth and share the good news as to what they need to hear. So let me ask you this morning, when was the last time you shared the gospel with somebody? If you're a disciple, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a Bible-believing, saved, Holy Ghost-filled, Spirit-led Christian, when's the last time you shared the gospel with someone? When's the last time you talked with someone who doesn't know Jesus Christ about your faith and about your Savior? It's not the pastor's job, it's yours. It's yours. Guess what? One day, I'm not going to be here. 
It's your job. One day I'm not going to be here. It's Grace Church's job. It shouldn't matter who's standing in this pulpit or who's standing in this position as pastor. I hope you're here and you're a part of Grace Church, not because of a man, but because of a Savior. And I hope that you're committed to Grace Church and furthering his commission, not because of a loud mouth, hot-winded pastor that yells at you on Sunday mornings and tries to motivate you on Sunday mornings and gets you to have a burden for lost people on Sunday mornings, but because you love Jesus Christ and you follow his commands and because he saved you and you were willing to experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you have a burden that you want to see other people experience the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Because if you're just banking it on me, I'm going to be gone one day. If you're banking it on Pastor Peter or whoever you look up to, we're going to be gone one day. We're just men. We're just women. But if you're doing this because you love the Lord Jesus Christ and you want to serve him and you want to follow him because of what he did for you and how he saved you, baby, that passion never goes away. That passion never goes away. Don't be scared. That's why we put it in every single aspect of our ministries. The greatest thing that we can give you is the gospel. That's why if you go to Gifts of Grace, before we give you food for your belly, we're going to sit down and we're going to tell you about food for your soul. We're going to tell you about Jesus. Because if you die and go to hell with a full belly, (laughs) we didn't do our job. But if you die hungry with Jesus and you go to heaven, we did our job. That's why we do it with helping hand. We offer prayer. We're not just there to give you a hot meal, but we're there to pray with you and know what's going on in your life, to show you the love of Jesus Christ, and if the door opens, to give you the gospel message. That's why we make it paramount that every single time that you hear a message in this church, there is the gospel that is proclaimed, there is an invitation that is given, because if it's not driven to a decision point for you, and you walk out of here and you take your last breath and go to hell, we didn't do our job. Pastor Jeff, I I don't want to offend people. You know, we live in a very highly offensive culture, Pastor. I don't want to... Listen to me, church. Listen to me. I saw this somewhere this week, and I I wrote it down. Wonderful phrase, wonderful quote. If you are silent about your beliefs because you are worried someone will be offended, then your beliefs are not that important to you, but rather what people think about you is. Let me read that again. If you are silent about your beliefs because you are worried someone will be offended, then your beliefs are not that important to you, but rather what people think about you is. The Lord gave you a message. The Lord gave you a gospel to preach. You're supposed to take that gospel and proclaim it to make disciples of Jesus Christ. Whether it's in the building of a church or outside of the building of a church. You're supposed to proclaim it and make it known. As the worship team gets ready to come back up here and bring us into a final song and an invitation for us for salvation or or commitment unto what God has called us to. Listen, you may say, Pastor Jeff, this is a tall task. It is, but don't worry. Notice how it says on the screen, it's your co-mission. Did you see that? It's your co-mission. Did you notice in the scripture in verse 20? You're not asked to do this on your own. Aren't you glad that the Lord doesn't call you to do something and then leave you alone, but the Lord is with you everywhere you go? And the Lord has given you power to perform the things that he has called you to do? Look at verse 20 of Matthew 28. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. I'm going with you. Not only is the Lord with you and he doesn't abandon you, but verse 18 says that he has all power and authority. So if he's with you, you've got all power and authority in the name of Jesus to proclaim the gospel and make disciples. To proclaim it. And can I tell you something, church? Listen to me. 
that's all you're called to do is to proclaim it. You can't save anybody. Jesus Christ saves people. You are to be his witness. Because here's the thing. You can proclaim it. Can I tell you, most of the times you're going to get rejected. It's okay. Everybody goes through it that's faithful in proclaiming the gospel. You're going to get rejected. How do I know that? Look at verse 17. I'm sorry, I'm quick hitting you here real quick with the passage. Can you believe this? He calls his disciples. It says specifically the 11 disciples who have now spent 40 days with a resurrected Savior, who have heard him preach about the kingdom of God, who has tasked them to do many things before he ascends. And what does it say in verse 17? And they saw him and they worshiped him, but some doubted. Wait, what? Still some of them doubted. He was right there. Not all of them are going to get it until he's gone, but he was right there. And some of them doubt. Ladies and gentlemen, you're not going to get a 100% acceptance rate when you proclaim the gospel. Some are going to doubt. Some are going to wonder. It's not always going to. But still be faithful in proclaiming. Still go forward and make disciples. Every head bowed and every eye closed this morning. How about you? How about you this morning? I I know I've talked a lot to Christians. I've talked a lot to church. But maybe you're here this morning and you're not saved. Maybe you're here this morning and you, you wouldn't classify yourself as a disciple of Christ. You wouldn't classify yourself as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me. You cannot make a disciple of Jesus Christ if you aren't one to begin with. Are you saved this morning? Maybe you've heard about all these things as to what the gospel is. Yes, it's true. The word of God is true. Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That's why he came. He came and he offered his body up. He was the perfect lamb of God. They put him on a cross. His blood was shed so that your sins could be forgiven. All of your sins, past, present, and future. Pastor Jeff, I just can't wrap my mind around it. Guess what? You don't have to make sense of it. All you have to do is believe it. Recognize that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. And that Savior is Jesus Christ. If that's you this morning, I'd cry out to him. The hour's getting late. Either he's going to part the clouds and the trump's going to sound, and if you're not found in him, you're going to be left behind. Or you could walk out of here and take your last breath today, and if you're not in Christ, if you don't have the covering of his precious blood, you will go to a place called hell that was not meant for sinners, or it was not meant for people, It was meant for the devil and his angels. But there's got to be payment for sin. And if you don't take on Jesus' payment for your sin, you will have to pay for your sin. And that's an eternity of separation from God. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ, or if you don't know heaven is your destination, take care of it before you leave. Come and talk to me. Come forward during the final song. Folks, it's why we exist. Don't walk out of here and say, I'll wait till next week, or I'll wait till another time. You don't know when you're going home. You don't know when the Lord's coming back. Take care of it now. He'll take you just as you are. If you're here this morning and you're a Christian, maybe you needed a fire lit under you today. The church isn't about A, B, and C. The church is about making disciples. The church is about preaching the gospel so that the lost may be found, so that Jesus may be proclaimed. Maybe you've never shared your faith. Maybe you can commit to the Lord today. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to my lost friends. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to my lost relatives. I'm going to talk to my lost coworkers about Jesus Christ and share with them the good news because I don't want them to go to hell. I want them to be saved. 
It's the most loving thing you can do is to proclaim the gospel to people 